All right, everybody, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to day two, fabulous people. Um, going to, to uh, preserve the maximum amount of time for uh, our excellent discussion and question and answers to sort of forego the remarks, but, but say that so far this has been amazing for us and we're very, very glad you're here. Um, so our first panel today is Rhetorics and Realities. Um, we have presentations from Alex Douglas, remotely, uh, and Nicola Matthews, uh, presently. Um, we will go ahead and begin with Alex Douglas's What Must We Be Like for Money to Exist? Alex Douglas is a lecturer in philosophy in the School of Phil Philosophical, Anthropological, and Film Studies at the University of St. Andrews. His research focuses on early modern rationalism, particularly the philosophy of Spinoza, his first book proposed a new interpretation of Spinoza, situating him in the context of debates over the status of philosophy and its relation to theology in the Dutch Republic. He also works on the philosophy of economics and has published a book examining the concept of debt from the perspective of language, history, and political economy. Without further ado, let's welcome Alex. So we'll let this roll and then uh, go into our next presenter and, and plan to sort of discuss and maybe even respond uh, uh, remotely to Alex here. All right, hello. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person and hear all these fascinating looking presentations that I've seen on the schedule. I hope I get the chance to speak to some of you about these. Um, I'd like to thank Scott for the invitation to present at this event. I would like to talk to you about Spinoza, who is a philosopher I've spent most of my time researching. Spinoza is interesting in understanding the history of how we think about money, I propose. Even though Spinoza has very little directly to say about money, because he was born into a merchant family in what was then the financial capital of Europe, he must have thought about it a lot. And although his comments directly and explicitly about money are few, there's a very interesting psychological theory that underpins it, I believe. And thinking about this story allows us to find layers of hidden depth in the classic story that's told about money by Western philosophers in the early modern period. I mean, the sort of account that you get from classical economists of the nature and function of money. Spinoza presents something like that story, but in a way that brings out how problematic the story can be and how ambivalent the institution of money really is. That's what I'd like to try to show. Spinoza's account of money appears in the fourth part of his masterpiece, his philosophical masterpiece, The Ethics. And there he tells a story that's similar to the story that Hume, Adam Smith, Turgot tell about money, at least on the surface. The idea is that because we're complex organisms, we have diverse sorts of needs, we have varied abilities, exchange is very beneficial for us. If I'm good at making what you need and you're good at making what I need, we can have a positive sum exchange. Money is useful as an instrument of exchange. Elsewhere, Spinoza refers, as Smith does, to the mutual benefits of the division of labour. When people can specialise, they can produce on the whole a lot more. But if you specialize, you only produce one commodity and you need many. So again, this can only work if we have a system of exchange. So again, you might think, well, money is useful as an instrument of exchange. Spinoza, however, doesn't say very much about why money is useful as an instrument of exchange. We can suspect that he might be thinking along the lines that Adam Smith thinks, that because money is durable, or well, Locke thinks this as well, I guess, various sorts of roles that get assigned to money at this time as a medium of exchange, as a store of value, as a unit of account. Um, 
but you know, the, the story is in some way, money allows for a type of exchange that we can't have with barter, direct barter. One thing exchange requires, whether through a monetary medium or not, is this kind of inversion of wants between two agents. So in a simple case of exchange between two agents A and B, if A possesses commodity S and desires commodity T, and B possesses commodity T and desires commodity S, then we can have a mutually beneficial exchange. If we don't have this symmetry of desires, the symmetry of desire against possession, then we haven't fulfilled the conditions for a mutually beneficial exchange. And one thing that you can't have is for all agents to desire the same, one and the same good, because then that breaks the symmetry that's needed for exchange. This is an important point and it's not always emphasized by the early classical economists. Spinoza, however, has a psychological theory which sows some doubt about the achievability of this situation of symmetrical desires. For Spinoza, we're subject to at least two social forces which make it very difficult to sustain a situation in which people have these complementary desires um, and can remain in that situation. The first of these is what Spinoza calls emulation. Spinoza claims in the ethics that when we see people affected, emotionally affected or psychologically affected in a certain way, we tend to imitate their affects. Here's reasons for this, which I won't go into here. And from this arises something which he calls emulation, which is a desire for something which is generated in us from the fact that we imagine others like us to have the same desire. So in other words, he has a rudimentary version of the sort of uh, Thorstein Veblen, or John Kenneth Galbraith uh, theory of imitative desire, desires, interdependent desires. We take on the desires that people around us seem to be manifesting. We don't, we're not simply born programmed with a set of unique individual desires, which are then insulated from social pressure. What we want is very often what we perceive others to want. With René Girard as well, it's this theory, mimetic desire. Moreover, Spinoza thinks not only do we have a tendency to take on the desires of others, we also have what he calls ambition, which is the desire to be, the striving to be imitated in our desires. So not only do we kind of want to imitate the desires of others, we also want them to imitate our own desires. So you have this sort of positive feedback loop. Each person, he says, wants others to live according to his temperament. And then he says, interestingly, when all alike want this, they are all alike an obstacle to one another. And when all wish to be praised or loved by all, they hate one another. And this is very much in line with the theory of René Girard, what happens is because we want people to like the same things as us, desire the same things as us, we in fact encourage rivals to our own possessing of the things we want. Right? In a way, Spinoza's theory of desire acknowledges a kind of fundamental insecurity we have about our own desires. If we just knew what we wanted, if we were the sort of um, self-satisfied rational agents that you find in economic models, we would just be aware of our own desires and we would uh, pursue them with perfect rationality. But the problem is we don't know what we want. And because we don't know what we want, we seek confirmation of our desires through the imitation of others. Interestingly, this is fairly widely recognized, I think, as economically important in the 17th century. Maybe the point is kind of lost into the 18th century. You do have a lot of 
course, about um, sympathy and imitation of certain passions in people like Hume and Smith. But the fact that this, the idea that this happens with desire and the way that that could play havoc with the nice sort of symmetrical picture that you need to have uh, a picture of mutually beneficial exchange, that point seems to me to be lost somewhat in the 18th century. Hobbes, for example, who no doubt an influence on Spinoza, um, he seems to be very much aware of this tendency. So he knows, of course, that when people have an appetite for the same thing, which they can't enjoy in common, nor yet divide, obviously that leads to conflict. And more interestingly, in the, in the Leviathan, he calls the desire of riches covetousness. So the desire for wealth is fundamentally a covetous desire um, because, he says, men contending for them are displeased with one another's attaining them. So wealth for Hobbes is an exclusive good. To pursue material wealth, an intrinsic part of the pursuit of material wealth is the desire that other people don't achieve it. So when you have these forces of emulation and ambition at work, the way this breaks the symmetry of desires that underpins mutually beneficial exchange. Um, Michel Aglietta and André Orléans have a whole book devoted to this phenomenon called Le Violence de la Monnaie. As they put it, we are led irrevocably towards the destructive violence of doubles. That's to say, people, psychological agents who m mimic each other's desires which radically excludes the double coincidence of wants by which barter could be made possible. So this is one problem, if you buy at all into the psychological theory, with the idea of a uh, barter economy into which money could evolve as a device for facilitating exchange. A barter economy requires double coincidence of wants, but if desires are mimetic, if they're subject to these forces of emulation, ambition, then you're going to have this double coincidence of wants being constantly undermined by a convergence of desires onto a single commodity. We have a political problem when we have ambition and emulation at work. As uh, we saw Hobbes saying, exchange is not no longer something that we can regard as kind of organically evolving from a society. Um, Frédéric Lordon, uh, along with André Orléans, so Orléans who wrote this book with Aglietta, who I, which I mentioned, they have this idea that money is somehow involved in the solution to this problem that arises through mimetic desire, through the um, convergence of desires on a single good. They cite this passage in Spinoza's political treaties where Spinoza says that other than uh, the simple imposition of political authority, one thing that can bind a society together to stop a society from falling apart into conflict is a common affect. It's this common affect this common feeling that binds the group, and in doing so engenders it and gives to it its specific power. Laudon and Orléans say that this happens both in political society and in the monetary society. What do they mean? Well, first they draw an idea from uh, Alexandre Mathuron. I've cited the wrong book here, actually. This is from um, uh, a book called Individual and Community, according to Spinoza. Individue communauté chez Spinoza. Mathuron thinks that because we're subject to these forces of ambition and emulation, because we imitate each other's affects, when you have a situation where people are all in conflict against each other, you can come to a sort of stable arrangement when, for example, um, there's a conflict between x1 and x2, and somebody imitates x1's hostility against x2. 
and then somebody else will imitate their hostility. And through this pattern of imitation, we end up having everybody taking the side of x1 and uniting against x2, because they're all imitating each other's hostility against this uh, unique individual. It's not a very nice account of how social unity comes about, but this is one possible dynamic to explain how a social unity can evolve in a situation of general conflict. The point here is that this, this mechanism of the imitation of affects is generating the unity. So now the uh, mimetic characteristics of human psychology work in favour of social unity, as opposed to working against it. Now, Laurel and Orléon take another step from here, where they say that rather than having a situation where everybody takes the side of one rival against another, we can have a situation where unity is brought about by everybody's convergence of desire onto a monetary good. So we saw that uh, mimesis and rivalry undermine the double coincidence of wants that's required for a barter economy, but Lord and Orleon are pointing out now this can also help to found a different sort of economic order based around a monetary good. After all, money does facilitate exchange, they sort of see it the other way around. If everybody put, desires the same commodity, and that commodity is a monetary good, then people will end up exchanging with each other um, almost unwittingly. People will produce the various commodities that they can produce, and they'll exchange them for money, which is the thing that everybody wants. So rather than trying to first start with a barter society and explain from there how we get to money, they think that exchange kind of arises as a byproduct of uh, money, of the institution of money. Now the question is, okay, but you know, bearing in mind what Hobbes says, the desire of riches is covetousness, why doesn't this lead to a situation of social disunity? Why doesn't this lead to a situation of general conflict? One reason offered by Mascheron is that money is infinitely reproducible. And for this reason, it need not lead to rivalrous conflict. Because money is identified with the unit of account, not the tokens that are actually realizing a particular sum of that unit, It's possible for lots of people to possess money at the same time. There's no real scarcity. There's no scarcity of a unit of account, right? No matter how many times anybody measures a five foot line, we're not going to run out of feet. I think this is an important insight, but it leaves out something very important. Just because money is infinitely reproducible, in the way that Marchand suggests, does not mean that it's impervious to rivalry. And I think the thing we have to remember, um, I mean, for one thing, there might be just various economic reasons why money can't be held equally. Beth Lord has written about this. But more importantly, I think there's this, this point which Ruskin expresses nicely in Unto This Last. Uh, riches, writes Ruskin, are a power like that of electricity acting only through inequalities or negations of itself. The force of the guinea you have in your pocket depends wholly on the default of a guinea in your neighbor's pocket. Money is valuable on any theory insofar as other people desire it, for whatever reason. But if other people are satisfied with the amount they have, if they're not in default of the amount of money they want to have, then it loses its value entirely. Now, I think Spinoza is somewhat aware of this. He mentions, he says that money, so after this passage I quoted at the beginning where he says that money is useful as an instrument of exchange, suggests that, he then says that money becomes something very unuseful, very socially dangerous when people seek it 
neither from need nor on account of necessities, but because they have learnt the art of making money and aggrandize themselves for it very much. Because money is this rivalrous good, because we all have ambition, we want to be imitated in our desires, what we want is to possess something that other people don't possess and therefore desire. And so the desire to accumulate more wealth than others is a desire to aggrandize yourself in the sense that other people will then want what you have. You're sort of deliberately trying to create envy and you're deliberately trying to create envy because envy is a useful tool for being imitated in your own desires and therefore confirmed in them. So there's something very ambivalent about the institution of money in Spinoza's theory. Because money can so easily itself become the focus of rivalry, it's an ambivalent institution. It's necessary for commerce. Commerce, in the best case scenario, leads to peace. But as the subject of rivalrous conflict, it can lead to the opposite. Money is infinitely reproducible only because debt is infinitely reproducible. So yes, I can be in surplus. I can be in credit. I can hold more accounting units. I can earn more accounting units than I'm spending. But only because somebody else is spending more accounting units than they're earning. So to hold money is to hold somebody else's debt. And this leads to all sorts of conflict, rivalrous conflict. And then you then have, um, in response to a financial crisis, you have a sort of paradox of thrift effect where everybody is trying to pay down their debt, everybody is trying to move into credit, and of course everybody can't move into credit at the same time, because one person's credit is another person's debt. And so now we have a rivalrous conflict for a scarce good, not money itself, but credit, to be in credit. That's a scarce good. So I'll just end there really. I mean, the, the point is that when you work through the story that Spinoza seems to tell about money, at least as people like Laudon and Orléans interpret Spinoza, you have this very ambivalent institution. I haven't said anything about the role of the state here. I haven't talked about the state as a monopoly issue of a currency. I think that if you were to ask Spinoza how money, given this ambivalent position it has with relation to human affects, can end up being a stable institution, he would be very inclined towards the neo chartalist institution there, that it gets tied to a political authority and that's the way that it can work. But I don't have time to go into that now. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Would anybody mind if I took one of these waters? Because I am you go got this. parched. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay. <clears throat> Thank Everybody you. I should read his book. Definitely, yeah. Philosophy of Debt, Rutledge, yeah. 2014, 15, somewhere around. Look at that. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, no essential. Um, next, we are hearing from Nicola Matthews. Uh, making visible the unknowns of supposed knownness. Uh, Nicola Matthews is a PhD candidate at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She has taught economics at Metropolitan Community College, UMKC, Rockhurst University, and Park University. While teaching at each higher education institution, she has taught economics from a pluralistic approach with an emphasis on heterodox and MMT scholarship. She was a teaching assistant uh, to MMT scholar L. Randall Ray and worked closely with him and others on the Ford Levy Project, a research and dialogue project on improving governance of the government safety net in financial crises. Uh, Nicola Matthews lives in Sarasota, Florida.
thank you for the introduction. Um, so this paper is more or less about a nagging question that I've had for probably about 10 years now regarding MMT. So once, once I learned kind of the fundamentals of modern money theory and tried then to explain those fundamentals to other people, I usually encountered the same thing over and over again, and I think several other people have touched on that yesterday. So this paper, the, the impetus behind this paper is to get to that question, right, to get to that nagging question. Why is it that when you explain these, in some senses, some sense fundamental principles of MNT, that the immediate reaction, right, is just to reject it out of hand? Okay, so I just want to start off with a, a few quotes here. Uh, first one, everyone except an economist knows what money means, and even economists can describe it in the course of a chapter or so. And the second question here, or the second quote, is apparently this is something that Franklin Roosevelt wrote in his copy of this book called The Road to Plenty by Foster and Ketchings. And apparently inside the, the book itself, he wrote this little quip. Too good to be true, you can't get something for nothing. So this kind of idea about uh, money, is uh, it's been around for a long time. And uh, most everyone who's familiar with MMT is familiar with, with this kind of reaction. So what is the conventional wisdom in regards to money? Well, the conventional wisdom is an abstract Thing, right? So in terms of thinking about a thing, you're thinking about something that's tangible, something that's concrete, something that you could hold in your hand. Um, and I would argue that the beginning of this conventional wisdom is somewhat correct, and that's the abstract part. Money is abstract, but it's not a thing, right? It's not a concrete, tangible thing. Uh, so in an effort to try to get to a better understanding of uh, the abstractness of money and to communicate that abstract to people, uh, I want to look first at kind of the principles of modern money theory, and then I want to look at money as a sign. And so the majority of the, this presentation is going to be looking at money as a sign. But uh, let's just look at the literature first. There's been a lot of work over many, um, well, over 100 years now, basically, trying to get at this kind of understanding of modern money, and in particular, state money. So there's a lot of scholars working in this. And what are the principles that come out of that? Well, the first principle is that money is defined as a credit debt relation, where the liability of one party um, is an asset of the counterparty. So you can't have a debt without a credit somewhere. You can't have a credit without a debt somewhere. The second principle is that modern state money is the standard of value. It is the unit of account. And this is a very crucial point that a little bit later on we're going to get to. Um, and the other thing about state money is that the state controls in degree uh, through the operation coordination of Treasury and Fed, both the quantity of money, so the, the, the actual money supply, and also the price of state money. And as kind of a side effect, it also operates as the medium of exchange. But that's not the most important thing about money, the medium of exchange, although most conventional economists would argue, how do you define money? They would say, oh, well, we define money as the medium of exchange. They, they define money as its function, which I, I would argue that that's actually not the best way to think about money. Uh, number three, state money derives its value from the power of the state to enforce order. And what I'm getting at there is they actually have a military, they have a police force, and um, they can impose a tax liability. But the tax liability itself exists because they have a military, because they have a police force. 
Uh, number four, as a credit debit relation, state money precedes developed markets. Number five, state money can be relatively stable if managed. And number six, there's a hierarchy of money with state money at the apex, which makes all other classes of assets below the money unit of account. So what is the conclusion of MMT? Is that state money is boundless in its creation so long as the sovereign government retains a floating exchange rate, if we're talking about an open economy, and denies convertibility to other forms of value that might be scarce, like silver or gold. So how to convey this conclusion uh, to others? Well, I thought of two, two ways to do this. Um, and my original intent for the paper was to actually do both of them, but then I kind of got lost looking at signs and went down the rabbit hole way too long, so I never got to the historical count. Um, so in what follows is we're just, I'm just going to talk about money as an abstract sign and um, go through that. Okay, so the, the, semiotics is this uh, kind of science where you're looking at signs in general, but at least from my perspective, one way that you could think about signs is that they're just kind of communicative, it's, they're ways to communicate with others, right? And they can come in all kinds of different um, modes, but it's essentially how does one organism communicate to another organism? Two early pioneers of semiotics was Charles Peirce and uh, Ferdinand de Saussure. And even though Ferdinand de Saussure created his own kind of system of looking at signs, I'm going to use Peirce's system uh, for this exposition. So he had a tri tri triadic system for signs, and he he came up with some interesting words to uh, talk about this kind of system. Uh, the first is representatum, or what in the literature they call sign vehicle. And so I'm going to be using just the sign vehicle. It's easier to understand. So what is a sign vehicle? It's the actual sign itself, right? Um, and then there's the referent or object. So that's the thing the sign vehicle is supposed to represent, and then there's the interpretant, which is the interpretation of the sign, and critically, this last piece here, you can read a sign as a sign and know it's a sign, but actually misinterpret the sign. Um, and this is going to be important a little bit later on. All three of these elements make up the sign system. So if you have two and not one of these three, three parts, you don't actually have a sign system. You only have a few of these pieces here. All right, this is just an example of uh, this kind of more abstract way of thinking about signs. So if you, when we look at a stop sign, you don't think about, oh, what is that? How do I understand that um, object? Because you've learned how to read and it's just automatic. You see a stop sign, you stop. Right? But the stop sign is a kind of sign. So what is the sign vehicle? It's metal, it's paint, and they have, it has written words on it. Uh, what is the referent for the stop sign? Basically, the referent is and the action of stopping. So it's a sign about an action, right? It's a sign of an action. And then how do you interpret the sign vehicle? Well, the first thing is to read the word. If you don't know how to read, you're likely not going to see this as a sign. Um, so you have to read the word stop. And then you have to, uh, the, the second part of it is you have to stop moving forward. And again, you can misinterpret a sign. Most people who speak English would never misinterpret this sign, but there are many signs that are much more complicated than this. So I just want to uh, put these into um, more into like a kind of category here is that this particular sign has two modalities. One, it's a three-dimensional uh, tactile object and uh, is you also have to have a special kind of brain processing 
in order to read it. So as far as I know, no other animal uh, writes and reads. So that makes the human brain, there's something in the human brain itself that allows us to read and to write. Okay, so there are many different ways that you can express a sign vehicle. There's, they, they call it modalities. So you, it could be expressed visually, it can be uh, olfactory, kinesthetic, auditory, three-dimensional. Um, and then again, like I just said, there's a, this additional type of modality that the human brain has. Uh, and then all sign systems can represent either objects, quantities, relations, or action. So sign systems facilitate interaction and communication or are not about the actual thing they represent, uh, though they are necessary for organisms to move, grow, and reproduce. Sign systems are placeholders for the thing, such as object quantities, relations, and actions, but are not the actual thing itself. They are, you can think of these as kind of shape shifters, as uh, I think Rachel was talking about yesterday with the cartoon and that the cartoon is an abstract, an abstraction, and it's a very open medium that you could you can create at will, and so you could make your characters into anything basically that you want. And so I'm arguing here that the sign itself is a shapeshifter, so it can take any shape that the that the medium, the, the like say the modalities that it comes in. Um, and so I, what I'm proposing is that because of this that we should not define signs uh, by their form and function, <clears throat> right? Instead, I think that we should define signs um, more as bundles of communicative energy, not by their form and function. So Peirce had three fundamental divisions of signs. He had an indexical, iconic, and symbolic. I also read that he categorized over 59,000 types of signs, so, which I'm not going to go into that. I'll just use his, his basic three. Uh, the first was indexical, which is more concrete, it's more direct, it's more contiguous. You could think of things like pointing or gesturing. Um, you could think of things like guideposts, chemicals, pheromones. These things are not that difficult to interpret as a sign. Then he had a conic, which is less concrete, and it imitates the thing. So you can think of here paintings or three-dimensional sculpted objects. And then there's symbolic signs, which are the most abstract, indirect, arbitrary in origin. And most words are actually uh, symbolic signs. So in the animal kingdom, many species use indexical signs, though few use iconic and symbol signs. Uh, I, I would argue that most or only humans, well, maybe not only, but among the many different types of animals in the world, humans are unique in the, in the kind of symbolic signs that we use. Okay, so I'm going to go through some analysis of the types of signs, but because of it, it, it gets very difficult um, and it gets very complex. So what I did here is first I'm going to look at non-written signs and then I'm going to move to written signs. And I've also excluded um, signs of action and I'm only going to be looking at kinesthetic, auditory, visual, three-dimensional, tactility, and of course a special brain processing for reading. So there are signs of objects like a tree, sun, flower, and this can, they could come in the mode of kinesthetic, auditory, visual, or three-dimensional. So in, uh, this is just to give you kind of an example of the variety of signs. So you could point to an object, right? And that would, it's very clear when you point to something, it's very clear what you're getting at, right? It's not that confused. Uh, you can vocalize it, you can draw a picture of it, uh, or you can sculpt the object itself. There's also signs of quantities, which again can uh, be pointed to. You can vocalize it, you can draw or paint it, or you can sculpt a, a number of quantities that you're trying to demonstrate. 
So if you're trying to demonstrate 10, you could sculpt 10 objects. <coughs> and uh, there are also signs of relations, and I've added two subdivisions here, horizontal and vertical. I'm going to be talking mainly about auditory signs of relations and also three-dimensional <coughs> signs of relations. When, we're, when we get to money, it's going to be more into the three-dimensional and also in the written symbols as well. Now, in all uh, vocal relational signs, well, in actually all relational signs, period, there, it's a bilateral relationship. And the, it can have to, uh, the communication can have as limited purpose monies. So you think, we think of commodity commodity money in this instance. But they're not well suited for exchange and they can only be done in approximation. So in order to have more, preci more precision in exchange, you actually need to have a standard unit of value, not a unique unit of value, which these object-based relational signs are unique units of value. And to create a standard unit of value, you have, to, you have to think of it from the singular to the total or from the one to the all, right? Now I'm going to move on to written signs. Um, just with other non-written signs, they're also placeholders for object quantity relations and actions. Uh, written signs have only one modality, so they're not all written signs are only communicated through that, this whatever special processing that the human brain has to be ordered to write and read. And written signs are also meta signs because they are signs about signs. So for example here, a written word tree is first a mark sign, like a squiggle, right? And uh, that's made on some kind of material object where the meaning of the mark sign on the receiver end is to read it. So that's the sign of the squiggle. That's the first sign. And then once you've read the squiggle, it comes to approximate whatever the language by convention has deemed it to be, right? So if, um, if we were to try to read something in a, lang in a foreign language other than English, we, we wouldn't be able to read it. So we have to actually go through the process of convention of learning a particular language. Most written words are worked or arbitrary at origination and are context dependent. Because of this, written words <coughs> as a sign vehicle fall under the symbolical class and are, for the most, most part, fluid or unstable in, until settled. So written uh, symbolic words and numbers may come in a variety of material vehicles or vessels. They can come in things like stone, clay, wood, paper, electronic platforms. And in terms of styles, they can be poems, accounting, news, scholarly work, short stories. Written symbolic words and numbers as a sign, again, should be described as communicative bundles of energy semi-permanently captured in material form. And most, um, most of the population is familiar, right, because we have interaction with writing all, and reading all the time in various different forms. But I want to address a very specific <coughs> type of written sign and a, that has a very unique type of relation. And this is the written legal document for those uh, lawyers here. So legal relational documents or contracts have several unique characteristics. Uh, they determine who, is, who owes and who is owed. They carry additional markers such as, such as signatures and stamp symbols of authority. They represent embodied and enforced relations. So this point here is basically saying there's some kind of final um, arbiter behind the contract itself. Something goes wrong between a le uh, contract, then you go to the courts in order to settle. And the other thing about legal relational documents is that they're generally impersonal. Uh, written relational meta signs in the form of paper legal relational documents can reflect either vertical positions, 
as we've been talking about with the object-based relational signs, or they can reflect more horizontal positions as in equality between parties. Written paper legal relational document signs are susceptible to reification like uh, object-based relational signs, but only under uh, two unique conditions. These conditions are, one, that the vessel, right, so the piece of legal paper, the legal document, uh, must be distributed and possessed in degree to members of some community. So these kind of, if, if, if the legal document itself is going to be reified, right, if, it's got, if someone's going to value that legal document, that it has to be possessed by some proportion of the community. The second criteria is that the paper itself has to be made desirable, right? So why, 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 am, I, why am I arguing that these, these two conditions have to hold? Well, on the one hand, a private two-party legal document on a written piece of paper has very little relevance and very little value to an outside party. So if you think if you made a contract with someone, it's a legal document binding, uh, to someone else, if it's just a um, relationship between you and someone else, a third party or fourth party, it's not, it's not important to them, right? Especially if whatever the kind of contract that you made, it has only to do with those two people. So um, in order for more people to value, right, value this document, it has to be distributed more widely. Um, and the piece of paper itself has very little intrinsic value or, or no intrinsic value, right? And the second piece here is, on the other hand, a code that is written in a, on a huge stone slab by a central controlling authority does have relevance to an entire community. But in, if, it's, if it's written on a stone, you can't possess it, right? So these two conditions should have to hold in order for someone to reify it, in order for someone to give this thing more value than it has. How are uh, reified written paper legal relational documents interpreted? Well, they're usually interpreted as a thing of worth and a thing that is scarce, especially if the amount is artificially restricted by the controlling authority of that specific sign, whatever that may be. Um, it's not interpreted as a relational <coughs> message like those object-based relational signs because it is the general belief that most people may possess them reified uh, written paper legal relational document signs have unique units of value like object-based relational signs. They are created by lawyers working in corporations and legislators of lesser government bodies. And these signs today is basically what we call intangible property or intangible assets. Reified uh, written paper legal relational document signs are designed to be distributed but importantly here, they're not the standard, right? They're not the standard unit. We don't actually conduct our exchanges with these intangible assets. We use money, which is we call the standard unit. So how do we get then to the standard unit? Only a central controlling authority in vertical societies has the quality and capability to think about relations in respect to O and O from a single unit to the totality. Uh, in different times and different places, central controlling authorities developed their own standard of value, which eventually found expression in objects um, that were either in form of like an ox or a coin, right? And, and this is, we think of, um, when we think of hard money, we think of coin, for the longest time, this is how it was uh, expressed in. These are object-based standard relational signs. So I put in the, highlighted the S here, that these signs are similar to 
Uh, you can think of uh, the intangible assets, but they're the standard, and only the central controlling authority can actually create the standard. Around the 18th and 19th centuries, written standard paper relational signs began to replace these kind of uh, hard money signs, hard standard money signs. And these are also susceptible to revocation with the same two special circumstances hold it, ho holding that it must be distributed and made desirable, right? How are reified uh, written standard paper legal relational document signs interpreted? Well, like uh, when I started off the presentation, they are generally uh, interpreted as a thing of worth. And because they are the standard, they sit at the top of the apex. Uh, written standard paper legal relational document signs uh, like uh, the written paper legal relational document as well as the um, object-based standard relational signs are designed to be distributed to some proportion of the community and they're not tied solely to the possessor. As a sign and not as a relation or object, this uh, type of sign is a bundle, again, a bundle of communicative energy expressing the superior position of the central controlling authority to the community. So after looking at the uh, money as a sign and trying to, uh, trying to come up with a, some kind of better explanation to, to communicate what money actually is to the general population, I would offer one suggestion that from, the, from the research that I've done is just to try to create a new language and to talk about money in terms of a sign instead of its form or function, which we're all apt to do, myself included. Um, if you talk about money as a sign instead of its form and function, what you're doing is you're, you're in one sense, you're de-reifying this process, right, of this additional value that's imbued into the money thing. And you're, you're highlighting the abstractness of money. Because money is very abstract. Well, if you say, uh, let's just say, talk about money as a sign, then what you're saying is, let's, let's talk about money as its abstractness. Let's look at how abstract money is. And then maybe, I don't know if it'll work or not, to tell you the truth, but maybe it might actually have, maybe someone might actually think, OK, well, let me try to reconsider my, my preconceived notions of what I thought money was. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to say, I wish Alex was, was here I to know. respond, but, but I still just want to make a comment, let's say, sort of an imaginary question to pose to you. Sort of two parts. I want to say on the one hand, as someone who's been a long time studying early modernity, he does a wonderful job of summing up this, when he talks about Hobbes or Spinoza, this idea that is very prevalent, which is that the dominating human passion is this incredibly petty, <coughs> zero-sum end, you know. Uh, St. Thomas More tells a story about a guy who says, oh, he's given a wish, you can have anything you want in the world, but your, your buddy over there, he's got to get double what you wish for. So the guy says, well, make me blind in one eye, please. <laughs> so that idea is out there, absolutely. But at the same time, I don't know if Alex interrogated this psychology uh, the way I think he might have. I mean, not only can we really ask whether you, this, this notion of human nature is so petty, is so zero-sum, can really be the basis for, for any sort of sustainable social order. I just noticed in passing one thing he says. Uh, he's talking about Spinoza's opinion, but the way he says it, I, I don't think he interrogates it. He says, commerce leads to peace. Not argue that a Charles interpretation, the other way around. You know, peace leads to commerce. To have commerce, you need law, you need sovereignty, all of these things. I mean, indirectly commerce leads to peace because that's one motive to have peace because hey, then we can have commerce but you need peace first the whole idea that commerce leads
piece to piece. This is more of this sort of bottom-up exchange mentality, it sounded like. So I wish he was here, you know, to sort of get back there. But I'd say, yeah, come on. Are, are, are you a little more skeptical of Spinoza? And I, I didn't hear that, that interrogation of Spinoza's thinking. Right over. <laughs> Um, thanks, I thought that was a fantastic talk and a really interesting topic to start getting into. I know Bill Mitchell has been looking at semiotics and framing and things, so I think this is a really fruitful space to be, to be working on. Um, one comment is, I think Annalise Riles, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, mm -hmm. she's a legal anthropologist based at Cornell. Um, she spent about 10 years with the Bank of Japan, the back of house there, and one of the things that she looked at was the role that sort of third-tier lawyers who <coughs> didn't go into big law or government or anything end up working in the back of house there doing collateral documents and, and sort of putting together the complicated financial contracts that become the collateral for the financial markets, you know, whether it's mortgages or securities or whatever it is, and how that sort of very boring bureaucratic paperwork is really the stuff of legal magic that <laughs> is the engine of the shadow banking sort of financial innovation of the present. So I think that the focus that you're moving towards the sort of semiotics and formal language structure of legal documents is a really critical space. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of really juice, juicy sociology in the dryness um, there. <laughs> um, I think the question about the, um, the way that you're framing it as, as a, a sort of moving away from the values idea of credit debt relationship. Um, we talk about money as a sort of legal technology um, in, in a similar way and focusing on it as a conceptual frame. I'm curious if you see, um, if you see, again, the word state here, you know, as the critical component or whether that can be framed in a sort of legal sense uh, or, or what would be gained or lost from, from making that shift? If you're thinking. So the question is, if we're talking about it as a sign, you know, right. is it a sign of the state or is it a sign of law, and is there a difference there? I don't, I don't, I don't see it, a difference really, fundamentally, because the state is the institution that backs all law. Without the state, well, you could, you can make your, you could, theoretically make your own laws in smaller communities, um, but. <clears throat> Without some kind of central controlling authority, um, it's going to be like the Wild West to some degree. There has to because it would all it will always be someone will always say, "Well, okay, I see you made this law, but I don't agree with that. So I'm going to make a different law." So there's always going to be these competing interests in terms of if you don't have the state. Now, you, you could ask. Uh, another question, well, how much control do we have in the state generally, right? That's another problem. So just having the state to me is not the answer. To me, it's got to be having some central authority, but having a bigger and, and more participatory uh, application to the general people who live under the state, right, who are the citizens of that that those legal codes, like our most precious legal code, is the Constitution. So we live under the Constitution. Um, but this, I think it, you have to, at least from, from my understanding, you have to have some commanding authority, some central commanding authority, but you have to also have another piece, and that other piece is the participatory piece. You can't just be uh, some superior institution of which top-down determines. There has to be a flow, and, and a frequent flow back and forth between the two. Here we have uh, another question. Thank you for such a stimulating presentation with so much thought into that. Um, Zimmel uh, wrote, I think, you know, uh, sociology of money that was based very much on money as a sign, which mm -hmm. is if you want to see what, you know, others have done on that. But, um, you know, there's also um, this issue of, you know, you began with how 
we communicate to others, you know, about this? And the the issue of the inherently coercive tax driven money is coercive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I started to look into voluntary taxation. Mm -hmm. And it has existed. Uh, so, you know, when you say more participatory mm -hmm. uh, forms, how can we, you know, envision a less coercive or, uh, you know, when a community decides that if we understand, then we, we set up the system so that it can work for us. So, Anyway, uh, I am sorry that you did not get to that number one, which oh, um, yeah. the historical uh, part, because I'd be very interested to even give us just the littlest bit of an idea of what kind of things you would uh, sure. be doing there. I was, well, I actually began the research and then stopped and then started looking at semiotics and then went down the rabbit hole and was like, nope, can't, I can't go <laughs> get the history yet. But when I began it, the central question I was asking myself was, um, if people's perceptions are determined by their life experiences, right, then, over the, and I was, I was gonna limit the, the actual historical era that I was gonna look at I was going to look at um, roughly late 1600s, 1700s in the U.S. up to today. So what I was going to do was look at various times throughout that span of how people, the kind of impressions and the and kind of interpretations of money and the difference, um, different usage of money. Be one of the things that I was reading was that Massachusetts Bay Colony was the first in the U.S. to issue basically state money because it was the central controlling authority in Massachusetts. And I was d doing some reading on how, the, how did people perceive that. And it was, you know, some people thought uh, it was the end of the world and that, you know, it was the worst possible, it was the biggest sin possible. You can't just issue dollars, you know, or, well, they didn't call it dollars then, but can't just issue it, then other people uh, interpreted it kind of as what it is. It was, a, it was a tool for that central authority to do something. And what were they doing? Basically, they were issuing that currency so they could pay soldiers so they could go out and fight a war with Canada. And they didn't have, because the, the I, I would argue that the standard unit back then was coin. That was the standard. So that was what everyone ran to when they needed it, right? So, but it was scarce in, in Massachusetts because of the export policies and most of the coin that they had got sent back to Britain. They didn't have any coins, but they needed to pay these soldiers. So they issued some currency and gave it to the soldiers. And there were a, a wide variety of people who looked at it as, oh, you know, that's, it's a tool. They're just using a tool. Now, uh, over the course of the next hundred years, several other colonies started doing the same. And then this, there was hysteria about it because some, I think it was Rhode Island, was issuing too much and they weren't controlling it. Because the thing is, if you're going to use it as a tool, it has to be managed. You can't just, and I would, I would argue, all, all MMT scholars know this, you can't just issue currency ad infinitum, right? You can't just th put it out there and then just keep printing and keep printing because you will have inflation. So you have to control it. You have to manage it. That's the, that's the, um, that's maybe the, the backside to the fact that you're actually just issuing something out of thin air, right? So you have to manage it. And there were several, con there were several colonies that managed it very well. And the people in those colonies, how they interpreted money was they, as basically a tool, they, they were okay with it. It was managed well. And I think that's, that's a, 
a piece that kind of gets neglected about the management piece, right? It has to be managed. Um, and uh, most people, I think, would in general interpret money because I think it's a thing, right, an abstract thing of the most value that of, sits at the apex of, of all values, that that thing is just somehow even it is kind of a contra contradict or a paradox in some ways because if they believe it's a thing that can be issued at will, then you would think that they would understand that it's not uh, an obstruction, right? It's not scarce. But I, th I think because of the reification process, they think that, oh, you just put too much money, you just dump too much money in the economy, you're going to have inflation, right? That's kind of long-winded <laughs> long answer, but that, but that was where I was going, was looking at that, those kind of impressions, interpretations of, of money back then, of their lived experience, you know, how people actually had to interact with money, and they had to interact with money differently. People who lived in rural communities in the 1700s didn't interact with money that much. They didn't have to, right? And in some cases, a lot of things were just bought on credit from the grocer. Right? They just bought it on credit, so they didn't actually have to interact. I think the, the next step would to be <clears throat> see how their interpretations, those kind of interpretations, those particular conditions can be then applied today. Right? How do we then take that and apply that somehow to, to what's going on today? Thank you. I, I, I want to exercise my temporary uh, sovereign authority as uh, moderator uh, yes. of, of this panel to just sort of kind of note a connection between this, this your presentation and Alex's work, um, and and comp, you know compliment both of you on very very uh, compelling presentations. But I particularly liked in your in your paper the idea of a communicative energy in the sign, which. What I like about that is it, it sort of gives the idea of the sign a kind of sense of history that I think is lacking sometimes when we think about signs. And, and in Alex's book, he talks about, you know, the one criterion concept of money that folks like Friedman and others who define money as that which we agree to observe and identify and use as money. Like, so it's it's this tautology. Money is what what we use it for and also mm -hmm. what we agree it is and there's no kind of like material history to it so like energy a bundle of energy suggests to me you know a history a trajectory that energy comes from somewhere and you can <coughs> tie it nicely there at the end into the kind of like institutional legal history um, um, behind uh, well, I just wanted I didn't actually say in the presentation but the uh, one of the reasons well there were two reasons for me to go kind of go down that route one was that I was having a difficulty with the way most people define money, form and function. Um, so I was having difficulty. I was like, okay, well, I don't. It's not its function. That's not. That's not what the money thing is about. And then I started think, looking at the form part of the money, and then that didn't seem like it's. If you to think about paper money, it's a piece of paper. Like that can't. That can't be it. So that was one reason. The other thing is that, um, so, to me, signs are real. They're not fictional or artificial, because if you think about a sign as a, as a way of communicating to others, it's, and, and all organisms do it, so how could it be uh, unreal, right? It has, there has to be some realness to it. It's not a, like a material object like this bottle of water, right? But I don't think a physicist would say that energy is not real. It's, it is a real thing, so I wanted to kind of add that dimension into the, this kind of idea of the sign, that, 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 that is actual a real thing in the world. And in, in the philosophy of that, Alex spent some nice time talking about this stuff too. And, and the, the, what I like about what you just said and what you gave in the presentation is the sense of kind of like, yeah. There, there's, it's more than what we just sort of arbitrarily and, and kind of ahistorically agree, as though we could withdraw our agreement to observe something as money at, at any given time. So anyway, with that, I will conclude my uh, uh, tirade and, 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 and exercise of tyrannical power. That's and a tirade? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I got more. Uh, we can talk about it over coffee, though. Um, thank you very much, and let's give a round of applause.